blockchain, blockbuster panel. Um, okay, and I'm going to introduce the moderator now, Lori Ayanu from CNBC. Uh, Lori and I have worked together over a number of years, and I'm so happy to see her here. Lori, why don't you come up? Uh, and uh, introduce the panelists here, uh, Mitchell Dahm, Lou Kerner, Paul Brodsky, and Jovic Jovan Putra. Uh, so uh, please uh, just have a seat. Thank you. Thank you, Marika. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure being with everyone here today. Uh, my WeChat is just my phone. Okay. So we're here today to talk about a really, really exciting topic, and that's the innovation and blockchain. And what we're seeing is a tremendous paradigm shift happening in the financial world that's really turning capital markets on its head. I don't know how many of you really know what blockchain and Bitcoin and cybercurrencies are, so can I have a, hit, a, a show of hands of how many people understand what blockchain is? Oh, that's terrific. A very informed audience. How many are crypto investors? That's a good question. Oh, quite a few crypto investors. That's Amazing. Cool. Well, today we had some really exciting news if you follow the market, and that's the regulars, regulators approved uh, Square's ability to trade uh, Bitcoin and other virtual currencies on its cash app. And that's a real milestone, especially in the United States where there's been a lot of, it's been hard to push through regulations on this issue. So we have a great panel of, uh, of experts with us today. I'd like to introduce Mitchell, Mitchell Dom. Mitchell, tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm a Bitcoin trader and do Bitcoin arbitrage. I run a hedge fund that trades Bitcoin. Terrific, Paul Brodsky, tell us a little bit about yourself, Paul. Turn it on. Yes. Yeah. Now? Yeah. Uh, I'm a partner with Pantera Capital. We uh, launched the first cryptocurrency fund in the States, and uh, now we're one of the largest investment managers of blockchain and cryptocurrencies. And we have Jakal Jokaputra. Jalik Jokaputra. Um, I'm founder of an early stage venture fund here in New York called Future Perfect Ventures. Uh, I founded the firm in 2013 to invest in uh, decentralized technology, including blockchain. I've been a VC since '99. Terrific. And Lou? I'm a VC at uh, Crypto Oracle, and we invest in crypto companies from the time that their ideas on napkins up to including when they're ICO. Wonderful. I think we're going to start the discussion with some basics. So Mitch, I was going to ask you, what is Bitcoin and blockchain and describe the basics of the market and how virtual currencies trade? So um, I answer this question to my children all the time and to the friends of my children because they all say, hey, daddy's involved in Bitcoin. And her friends always say, like, Bitcoin? What's that? So here's my uh, explanation to a 10 year old. So Bitcoin is money, right? Um, it's also a commodity like gold. Um, it's a currency like the euro or the Japanese yen, and it's a payment system like you would use your phone uh, to pay for a Starbucks. So if you understand what money is and the way that you pay for things and you understand commodity like, like gold, or uh, um, that's what Bitcoin is. It's, uh, but it's electronic and there are lots of other technical details, but that's the way I explain it to my 10 year old. And what is blockchain? So blockchain is, um, again, it's like most, most 10 year olds actually know what an Excel spreadsheet is. So I explain it that way. It's a, it's a more advanced type, but it's basically an Excel spreadsheet. And you know, in, in the first row uh, or, or in the first block, you have a name of a person, which happens to be a series of numbers, and the fact that you own, say, one Bitcoin. So then there's a transaction uh, when I sell Paul, one Bitcoin. So in the second block is that transaction. And uh, the, the blockchain is a series of, of those rows or a series of those blocks 
to keep track of, it's an advanced uh, record keeping to keep track of who owns what. Mm -hmm. And then there's a, there's a system where, whereby each uh, transaction that goes on is verified by independent parties, so they're called miners, um, so that you don't have to trust, you and I don't have to trust each other, we don't have to trust the bank, we don't have to trust mm -hmm. the government, because there's a series of independent parties that verify that transaction. I see. Well, what is a smart contract? A smart contract. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I don't know if my 10-year-old would understand this, but it's basically um, automating the enforcement uh, of a deal. So let's say I'm buying uh, a pencil uh, from, from J is it Jolly? Jolly. Jollic for one dollar, and we have an agreement. So I put my one dollar uh, into a say a Bitcoin account, and then when she delivers that pencil to me, um, automatically the money goes to her. So the advantage of this smart contract is that we're bypassing an escrow agent, we're bypassing um, uh, a bank. Um, we don't have to trust each other because the the uh, the automation enforces the contract. But why do you think innovators created blockchain technology? I mean, what's underpinning all of this? What is someone from the group want to comment on that? Well, uh, there is an anonymous creator, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, who kind of created the concept of uh, Bitcoin and blockchain as the underlying technology behind Bitcoin in the wake of the financial crisis uh, in 2008. And uh, Bitcoin kind of started, it was first issued in, in 2009. Um, and his view, or her view, but their view, was that um, uh, the banking system had failed us in, in the financial crisis, and why don't we really? We, why don't we have control of our own assets? Mm -hmm. And why can't if I own a dollar, why can't I transfer that over to someone else without uh, first holding an escrow or taking two weeks or you know, having 20% fees taken out of it? Right. Um, and and computers now do a lot. For us, right? Um, they they determine what we read. They mm -hmm. uh, determine a lot of the world around us. And so, why can't we use algorithms to actually verify transactions and then take all these intermediary fees out of the process? And Bitcoin was the first manifestation of blockchain technology by being a currency. But it can actually be applied to data. It can be applied to storage. It can be applied to anything where they're intermediary transactions. Right, and it's a very decentralized approach, correct? Right, because you need that kind of verification of multiple nodes um, of uh, a, a comp computing system right. or uh, validators uh, that all agree that a transaction has happened. And if there's some bad actors that uh, try to invalidate or uh, create fraud in the system, that transaction won't go through because all of these kind of nodes that are decentralized need to all agree on that transaction. Now, you mentioned it can be used for a variety of applications for business, consumer applications, as well as financial applications. Can you give me some examples? Well, so if I was thinking globe, yes. Hey, so um, I, I actually just uh, wrote a uh, blog post a couple weeks ago about uh, my favorite blockchain application, which is, and I describe uh, how I'm actually uh, in the process of getting divorced after 20 years of marriage. And you know what? It is, is very that because pleasant. Of, is that because of Bitcoin? No, 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 no. <laughs> Bitcoin. Bitcoin addiction. Um, but it is it's very unpleasant. It's very time consuming. It's incredibly costly. And I'm not sure whether, I'm a romantic, so I'd like to think I'm gonna get married again. I'm not sure whether I'm, on, I'm gonna get married again or not. But what I am sure about is if I do get married, it will be on the blockchain. <laughs> because we'll be able to put all our agreements there, whatever we agree to, what our marriage is gonna be, it will be right there, it's decentralized. So if one of us decides we want out of Dodge at any time for whatever reason, it's okay. <laughs> it will be a button, it'll be three seconds and not three oh. years and a lot of money. And that's just one, idea of what is an infinite number of ideas that with smart contracts and the blockchain you can basically not have your life decided by a man in the middle. Are you going to put the lawyers out of business? <laughs> oh, what do you think? I think Lou should go to urban China. <laughs> um, <laughs> So it all sounds very complicated in that. I mean, uh, 
I have an easier time thinking of, of uh, Bitcoin as, mo as money over IP, period. It's money over the internet, uh, and it's safe and secure, and it uh, blockchain, all it does is uh, act as a trust agent. Mm -hmm. So we don't need the third party trust agent anymore. We don't, it, it will have tremendous impacts on banks, uh, impacts on government services, impacts on across commercial verticals, various other things. Uh, and you, it's limited only by one's imagination in terms of applications. Tell me a little bit how investors are rushing into this market sector. I know you've raised funds. Um, tell us a little bit about the appetite amongst venture capitalists and hedge fund managers. So we run foreign investment programs, investment strategies, ranging the whole gamut. Uh, from a passive Bitcoin tracker, which was the first, uh, as I mentioned, uh, couldn't be a dumber fund, uh, all the way to uh, venture capital. We're raising our third venture fund right now. Um, and it ranges from cryptocurrency to equity, and you have a, a, a range of different investor types as well. Mm -hmm. We see uh, large family offices to institutional investors. Um, with varying objectives, investment objectives, and we are met, trying to match those uh, with them. Uh, the opportunity set is immense, we think. Um, I think one of the, I think the adult way to think about uh, crypto and blockchain and venture is that it's all venture. It's all very, very early at a $300 billion total market cap that might someday get to five or 10 or 20 trillion if you look at the various metrics, so. Where do you see most of the more money pouring in? And do you see most of the investment money pouring in from Asia, the United States, globally? Um, we see it, it uh, all three, Asia, the States, uh, North America, I should say, uh, as well as Europe. Um, and it's seriously just beginning because mm -hmm. as I, we, um, try to have institutional grade funds, mm -hmm. uh, and we're just starting to see significant institutions beginning to do their, what's called operational due diligence, uh, which means they're getting geared up. Mm -hmm. uh, once a couple of hurdles uh, are out of the way, we think uh, the broader market's gonna scale pretty dramatically. What's happening on the regulatory front in the United States? Do you feel that there's progress being made? Tell us a little bit about, give us an update on what's happening terms of adoption in the United States and regulation? Well, the, the SEC is planning to regulate ICOs or initial coin offerings. Um, ICOs are a method of fundraising right. and the SEC believes that if you're raising money from the retail public mm -hmm. and the retail public expects to make money, that's uh, that should be a regulated security. Now in, uh, in China, um, they've taken a completely different approach which is to ban all Bitcoin uh, trading at all. So in in around September of last year, they banned all Bitcoin trading. Why did they do that? Well, they were afraid mostly because uh, people were using Bitcoin to take RMB out of the country in violation of their capital controls. They were also afraid of fraud, they are afraid of speculation, but I think it was a grave mistake because they're discouraging investments in the blockchain technology. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm Chinese, so I'm very proud of the fact that China is leading the way in a lot of other technology sectors, A AI, robotics, 3D printing, etc. But they're really uh, falling behind, way behind, in uh, blockchain technology because of this short-sighted view of that Bitcoin is, is, is harmful. Japan, on the other hand, is taking the opposite approach, which is to greatly encourage uh, uh, Bitcoin and blockchain technology. They passed laws that significantly, uh, well, they legitimize uh, Bitcoin and encourage uh, blockchain investment. So while China is losing a lot of talent and losing a lot of money, Japan is getting, it, getting a lot of it, as is the United States. As a market trader, can you tell us a little bit about how virtual currencies are traded? Um, sure, they're traded on um, close to 200 exchanges around the world. Um, I'd say over 50 countries have digital exchanges where you could take the local 
currency, Japanese yen, Mexican peso, whatever, and exchange it for Bitcoin or Ether or any other, other currencies. Um, Paul spoke about investors in potentially his fund, institutional funds. We follow what retail investors do, uh, which I believe is a, probably about 100 or 1,000 times bigger than institutional investors at this point. And um, those, those retail investors uh, are speculating um, that Bitcoin price is going to go up. They hear that their cousin, their brother, their uncle uh, you know, put $10,000 and now they're millionaires. And everybody else too wants to do that. So throughout China, through Japan, Korea, retail investors are jumping on the bandwagon when they think Bitcoin uh, will go up in order to, to be the next crypto millionaire. So how can an average investor get involved? Well, you open up an account uh, at, at an exchange. Uh, if you're Chinese, you would I would recommend that you open up an OKCoin OK or B or, or BTC China or Binance. If you're United States, you would open up at Kraken or Bittrex or Loniex, um, uh, ItBit and others. You open an account like a brokerage account and uh, wire money and buy Bitcoin. And is that a crazy idea? Well, I you know a lot of people because they know I've been in business for so long. You know, should I buy Bitcoin? And I, my answer always is. It's a good time to learn about Bitcoin, and 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 that is, you take a hundred dollars or you know some amount that is your play money. You're not afraid of losing it, and buy Bitcoin because once you put your money down, you'll check your phone. You know I I happen to check it every hour or more frequently, but you'll check your phone once a day, and you'll see it going up and down, and you'll say, well, why is it going up and down? And then you start reading the news, you'll learn, and then you'll decide, is that you know, up 10x and then down 70% is that volatility for me? Can I sleep at night with that type of movement? And then you could decide. Well, I'd like to ask the group one general question. Describe the risks and the rewards for investors. Okay, I, I think the right way to look at this is it's just a new asset class. And new asset classes come along all the time. You know, there didn't used to be junk bonds and you know, then Michael Milken invented junk bonds, and you know all the other investment banks said they would never do junk bonds. They're too volatile. They're Ponzi schemes. They're horrible. And 40 years later, everybody does junk bonds, and it's just another thing on the shelf. And you know that's where crypto is going. That's where what Bitcoin is, and Bitcoin's one of a lot of cryptocurrencies that you're going to see emerging. You know, over the next few years, this is the next computing platform. It's you know, for, as an investor, it really feels like 93, 94 internet. It's the very beginning. Nobody knows exactly what it's going to be, other than it certainly feels like it's something that's going to be really, really big. Do you feel like there's a grassroots movement to try to push it, push the adoption? You know, the the, the biggest difference that the, the, the you know crypto work might come to that we really believe between crypto and everything that came before it is the importance of community, because now. You can, you know, not just use Facebook as a user, but you know, if you believed in Bitcoin and you helped Bitcoin early on and you mined Bitcoin and you were part of the Bitcoin community, you know, you benefited from that financially. In addition to feeling that you were making the world a better place, mm -hmm. and so a lot of it has, you know, it's it's a lot of this is community and how you're going to engage with people, and you know, what community are you building that people want to be a part of? Right. Well, how have you been marketing your funds? and promoting uh, blockchain technology and virtual currency? So we um, have a reasonable position in this space and we have a lot of income, which is nice, uh, people that are curious about it, uh, to the point where for a time there in December and January, I felt like a prom queen because everyone <laughs> wanted to talk to me. Um, that since abated somewhat, um, but uh, we reach out and uh, take uh, the incoming and word of mouth. I was uh, listening to one of the previous panels on brands, and uh, Xiaomi sounds very viral. Uh, this is very much a viral market. And uh, when you have a conversation with one person, they will inevitably tell two or three. And that's the way that this is spreading. Right. Why do you think, Mitch, there's been so much momentum in Asia that they're leading the pack? Because Chinese are speculators and gamblers. I see. <laughs> That's a short answer for you. Yeah. So talk about, uh, I'd like to ask the whole group, the challenges that lie ahead in this fast-growing market. 
let's talk about some of those challenges. People have talked about transparency issues, hacking of exchanges, price volatility. So, so in order for Bitcoin to go mainstream as a payment system, it has to be as easy as Alipay. So the technologists have to work on that user friendliness, and if they can achieve that, then uh, it'll go mainstream for payments. Right. Uh, I mean, the, the biggest problem, you know, the decentralization is great and getting rid of the man in the middle is great. And the problem, though, is uh, there's actually not yet really an effective governance because you can create something great like Bitcoin, and Bitcoin is amazing in its ingenuity and what it is, but what it did not do really well was create a governance system that enabled it to become a better thing over time and evolve, which you need to do, right. you know, if you're going to be the winner. Um, and so, I, in, in my view, that's you know the effective governance systems, and we're having you know the, the literally kids are going to get PhDs in decentralized governance. A lot of people are thinking about how to solve that, and that's that's you know Very I think a big decision. Yeah. Well, I I think Lou mentioned that we're in like 1993, 1994 internet, um, and I started my venture career in '99 and out in Silicon Valley, and we saw pets. Com. We saw Cosmos out here. A lot of business models that now make sense. I mean, we um, we have uh, delivery services. Um, we all use uh, e-commerce uh, for buying goods, but um, we still uh, need to build out the infrastructure around a lot of this. And so, what I'm seeing, and 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 we're investing out of our, our second fund now, and what's different in the second fund versus four or five years ago with the first fund. Um, was that we're seeing entrepreneurs go straight to that application layer of like, wow, you can do all this mm -hmm. cool stuff. Um, well, it's not quite possible yet until we have more scale scalability on and the underlying infrastructure. There are lots of smart people working on all of that. I think it's going to take less than 20 years to get us to that point. Um, but, but I think we're getting ahead of ourselves in terms of what the technology can actually do. Um, and that as an investor, uh, whether you're investing in um, token offerings or whether you're a venture investor like our fund, you need to, to make sure that the timelines, expectations are in line with the underlying technology. Cool. One, one of the people that works at our firm uh, created the first um, uh, project on the Ethereum blockchain and did the first ICO. And it's about to go operational now, only now, uh, for uh, probably July 9, we think. And he'll be the first to tell you there isn't enough throughput capacity to make it run as it one day will. So that's a definite hurdle. Um, another uh, regulatory clarity uh, for there to be sponsorship on a broad basis and from institutions, there has to be more regulatory clarity and uh, not so much in the venture space, which we do, but, all, but in the crypto space or in the token space, uh, we also have um, to have some custody. Uh, and so I think those are the three uh, hurdles that are being ground down pretty quickly. And I wouldn't be surprised if a few of those, uh, not throughput, but a few of those are taken away within the next, in a matter of months rather than years. Very exciting times. Thank you so much. I want to thank the panel for joining us today. Thank you. Took three years to reach fruition. Is that right? Uh, a couple years. About a, yeah. Yeah. About I, I, so years. the other day I was at a. I've been going to some blockchain panels myself lately, and um, and so uh, I'm learning more and more about it. And one of the th fascinating things I thought was people said there's no killer app for blockchain applications yet. So I just want to know why not. No, no, the, the, killer, app, the killer app of blockchain, is crypto. No, is, is <laughs> Bitcoin. Bitcoin itself. Is Bitcoin. And the killer app of Bitcoin is speculation. <laughs> okay, everybody, did you get that? I I think there are lots of places in the world um, that actually are using this technology, including you know one of my portfolio companies called Bitpesa in Africa. It can cost up to twenty percent of a transaction. 
um, to transfer money from, say, you know, Uganda to Nigeria, they brought it down to 3%. So while in some places in the world, you know, it, it's about speculation, and yes, there is a lot of speculation now, but I think, like, we're underestimating that, like, you know, a lot of the world is underserved uh, by even the technology that exists today. Oh, no, of, of course, there's a lot of complications, but the first, the, the first application I don't know if I'm going to get this. <laughs> <laughs> the first application yeah, is yeah, people, people, trying, people trying to make money. So As always is, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, thank you, blockchain enthusiasts. Um, we appreciate it. Thank you so much.